there. You are listening to In the Books, a podcast hosted by two period drama enthusiasts. Uh, my name is Michelle. You can find me at Musings on Instagram and Twitter, and I live in the States. And I'm Rita. I live in England. I'm at Annoying Rita on Instagram and Twitter. And welcome to the first in our series of podcasts on The Empress. Or if you're German, and please, please know that there's a dis giant disclaimer flashing in front of my eyes right now that um, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> the German title is Die Kaiserin. It's on Netflix. And it's about the life of Empress Elizabeth of Austria. In the German and Italian speaking world, Elizabeth is often associated with a trilogy of romantic films about her life, which starred a teenage Romy Schneider um, and made her famous worldwide. <laughs> the trilogy was the first to explicitly depict the romantic myth of Sissy. We will hopefully talk about the reality as we go along in the series. Now, she was depicted as this bright, colourful, sunshiny, loving wife, a devoted mother, <laughs> benevolent empress, friends to all animals, Disney princess cliche. <laughs> and I can't underestimate the cultural impact of these films. These films are shown every Christmas in Austria, Germany, um, some Dutch-speaking languages, Italy, French television. It's even Holy shown in cow. Portugal occasionally. They are a big fucking deal. And I wow. think as outsiders to this cultural phenomena, it's going to be very hard for us to really understand the legacy the show has to compete with here. But we will try our best to keep this in mind as we continue into the series. And we hope some of our listeners that have grown up with these films can get in touch and maybe share aspects that they think might be important. Um, but beyond the trilogy, the world is not short of depictions of Elizabeth. There have been three stage plays, two ballets, 13 films, including two coming out <laughs> this year and next. <laughs> Eight TV series, two children's cartoons, and, and a partridge in a, in a pear tree. tree. Probably like dozens of books. Couldn't get into it. Um, at this point, <laughs> I feel like that she may have become slightly more of a myth than an actual historical figure. And to pass out the reality from the fiction, I'm currently reading some supplementary books because hey, I'm That's Rita. Yeah, you can go. <laughs> if any of you guys are interested in finding out more, I can recommend the biography I'm reading. It's on Elizabeth. It's called The Reluctant Empress by Brigitte Harmon. And I'm also reading The Haps Bags by Martin Reddy on um, Audible. And that's much more general, but I was quite interested in how much incest and deformity there was in that family. So, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it's crazy. If any of you, our listeners have any recommendations for me to read, like, please let me know. I'm always up for learning more about European royalty and their messy, messy ways. Uh, much to the disappointment of my very Republican family. <laughs> but anyway, oh, oh, on gosh. to the recap. Okie dokie. So, the show began with a flash forward to a very nervous Elizabeth walking down the aisle of a cathedral on her wedding day, which I can assume is in homage to the final shot of the 1955 film of Sissy, which ends with her standing beside Franz Joseph at the altar. It also reminded me of the shot from uh, Sound of Music. Yes. Of, yeah, okay, my Maria. favorite wedding ever. Yes, yes. God, how many girls have watched that and have clung to that for their wedding, wedding day? Wedding yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Must be heavy anyway. on Pinterest. <laughs> oh, God, I bet. Um, we then hurtle back in time to the summer before the wedding. Elizabeth, hiding from her screeching mother in her childhood home. I would, too. Uh, said mother is uh, apoplectic because she's trying to broker a marriage between, between Sissy and a duke who happens to be coming for tea that morning. 
But where is his intended bride? Fleeing on horseback into the forest, astride, of course, um, wearing only a chemise and a riding coat. She cuts quite the romantic figure as she dashes, dashes across the scenic German landscape. But unfortunately, it all gets a little too scenic. <laughs> Uh, She nearly tumbles off a cliff when her horse is spooked. She lands on her ass and her horse bolts, leaving her stranded. One very pretty title sequence later, Mm -hmm. we meet certified hottie Franz Joseph I, (laughs) a.k.a. the Emperor of Austria. And also, if I read out his full title, it's like two paragraphs long. (laughs) He's the emperor of a lot of shit. Um, He's practicing his swordsmanship in the breaking light of dawn in one of those billowing shirts we love so much. Yes. It's quite the introduction. Mm -hmm. We then cut to his mother, Archduchess Sophie. She looks fierce as fuck as she marches around the palace in Vienna, barging in on her son in his study and remarks that he is up early. Turns out, (laughs) Franz never went to bed. It's hard to get a good night's kip when you're witnessing an execution in the morning. <laughs> Sophie tells him it's his responsibility and he'll get used to it. But I have my doubts about that because he's a sad, sad, sensitive boy. <laughs> back in Bavaria, Elizabeth is sneaking back into the stairway yard with her limping horse, who she tries to reassure, but something is clearly very wrong. So she goes to find her father who she finds lying in a heap of naked bodies <laughs> following a pretty wild threesome by the looks of it. <laughs> and I went, oh my, Me like young. a prude. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> scarring, scarring. <laughs> Meanwhile, downstairs, the Duke has arrived and Elizabeth's mother, Ludvika, I hope that's how you pronounce it, is having to make some really lame excuses for Sissy's absence. It's awkward. Yes. A. Mm-hmm. Elizabeth takes her her father to the stable yard, and note the the father is wearing just a pair of underpants. Um, I <laughs> think a, a, a very loose shirt and a robe that's just kind of hanging open. At, oh, and uh, boots like rubber boots, so that he can go into the horse. <laughs> he can go into the stable. It's it's. He, he, he's a picture. He's a picture. Um, anyhow, so uh, Elizabeth takes her father to the stable yard to show him the horse's injury. He berates her for always causing trouble. Elizabeth tells him she doesn't want the life her mother has planned for her, but it falls on deaf ears. Her father then pulls out a shotgun and tells her that her horse's leg is broken and will never heal. He gives her the gun and tells her to do it. Elizabeth refuses and insists it will heal, but her father is more realistic. The horse won't be able to walk again, and then he lays down some truth bombs. You ignore all the rules and do what you want, but that comes at a price. As the youth often say, fuck around and find out. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, or as my mother would say, keep on living. (laughs) 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 Elizabeth then watches her father... uh, shoot her horse, and it's awful. You can hear it thunder to the ground. Thudder. Thudder? Thudder? Is that a word? Apparently, because it didn't autocorrect. Thudder. Thudder. Well... (laughs) Maybe it's a British word. uh, (laughs) Could be. (laughs) As you know, live in the States, blinders (laughs) are on, you know, anyway. Uh, Yeah, it's it's awful. You know, you hear the, the horse just... And then it's crying. Oh. Clump to the ground. Oh. And she sobs and goes to comfort the dying horse. <sighs> and I cried too, because I can't have dying animals. That's... Oh, it, it was awful. Um, okay, back in Vienna, the trauma just keeps coming on. Franz Joseph and his mother walk out in front of a braying mob, with there to witness the hanging. Uh, the charges against the accused are read out loud. Conspiracy revolutionary conduct, lise majesty, and high treason. You'll have to tell me what that means. Oh, it's like insulting the monarch. French term. Oh, for God's sake. Um, Asked if they have any last words, one of them begins a tirade against the emperor and says the people will rise up against him. 
he is abruptly cut off mid-riot inciting speech by the hangman, who pulls the lever and snaps his neck. Franz Joseph takes hold of his most pointy military medal and begins to squeeze until blood pools out of his clenched fist. His face remains stoic as he watches the men swing. At this point, I was like, wow, this show is too dark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, wow, this is all happening in, like, what, the first ten minutes? It's the first it's, ten minutes. I'm like, yeah, it's <laughs> crazy. Because something <laughs> nice happened. <laughs> um, back in Bavaria, Elizabeth's furious mother yells at her for driving away yet another man. Apparently this was man number four. <laughs> oh, God. You go, and girl. She is mid-scream when she suddenly doubles over and clenches her stomach in pain. Apparently she has an ulcer and has recently been told by her doctor that if it ruptures, the internal bleeding will no doubt kill her. Elizabeth kind of shrugs off this news, <laughs> which leads to a, a very dramatic almost slap. Her mother thankfully stops herself at the last moment, stopping the scene from tipping into full-blown melodrama. It was... <laughs> we got very telenovelary. Um, yes. Elizabeth's sister, Helena also in the room, offers her mother some tea and tries to calm everything down. So we know what her role in the family is. Yes. The good daughter, the troubled daughter. Yes. <laughs> the conversation continues and it turns out the crux of their problem is that Elizabeth wants to make her own choices, which involves writing poetry for a living. Her mother tells her she has no idea how the world works which is possibly true, and that no one wants a girl like her. Turns out to be very much untrue. You just haven't <laughs> met Franz Joseph yet. <laughs> Ludovica, I don't know how to pronounce her name, sorry, officially at the end of her tether, then threatens to put Elizabeth in an asylum. Now, to be honest, Elizabeth kind of looks like she escaped an asylum in a horror movie in this scene. She's got, like, matted hair, she's covered in blood, she has scratches and scrapes all over her body, and she's still only wearing a chemise. So, you know, very much crazy lady aesthetic. Her mother then warns her that her sister Helene has a bright future ahead of her, and not to sabotage that for her. Not a promise that she can keep, I'm afraid. Doesn't even last the episode. Nope. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, back in Vienna, Franz Joseph and his mother are having a very awkward lunch together where they fight about the necessity of killing revolutionaries. Franz sees that the country is suffering after a cold winter and failed harvest, and he proposes that instead of hanging everyone who is unhappy, they might try and understand them. Sophie is unconvinced and tells him that the people's rage is, quote, like an ulcer, and ulcers need a remedy. <laughs> Guys, sound the klaxon. We Ow. have an, ult an ulcer motif. Ow. Yay! <laughs> I see what they did there. It was oh, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> There's a knock on the door, and suddenly a polar bear pelt is wheeled in by a servant who reads out a kind of passive-aggressive note from Tsar Nicholas II. He proposes a war against the sultans so they can solve Austria's clear, quote, bubbling revolution problem, end quote. Franz Joseph is like, uh, no way, Jose. <laughs> but it's only a matter of time before he gets dragged in. But don't worry, guys. Sophie's got a solution to the unrest. A royal engagement. Nothing distracts <laughs> from cold and hunger like a royal wedding. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Talk about out of touch. Um, uh, she shows Franz a portrait of Elizabeth's sister, Helene. Given the current geopolitical status, Sophie has determined that Franz needs to marry a Bavaria princess in order to strengthen Austria's position uh, against Prussia and the German Confederation. He will meet her next month in Bad Ischl for his birthday celebrations. Cut to Elizabeth. Helene and their mother in a carriage hurtling towards that very meeting. While their mother snores away, <laughs> Elizabeth writes poetry and Helene stares lovingly and starts kissing. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Yeah. A miniature of her future fiancé. Oh, Helene. 
Well, Helene tells Elizabeth that she asks for her to be brought on this trip because she worries about her. Elizabeth tells her <laughs> not to. She has thick skin. But Helene is like, girl, no you don't. Who are you talking to? <laughs> and then proves this by making Elizabeth read out one of her incredibly sensitive poems to her. It reads as follows. Swallow, lend me your wing. Carry me away to a distant land, and should I then fly with you up in the ever blue fig ferment? Ferment. Ferment. <laughs> with all my heart will I worship the God who set me free. Why are we recounting this whole poem? It's because the imagery is important, guys. It's important. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. They arrive at the palace a day before their hosts as they enter Ludovica. I've said that three different ways now starts barking orders at elizabeth on how to behave do not ask the emperor any personal questions no opinions or remarks and if she behaves she might get the scraps off the table in the form of the emperor's creepy younger brother mm -hmm. the sisters go to bathe the travel grot away and elizabeth lovingly brushes helene's hair Helene shares her worries about her betrothal, but Elizabeth tells her that she'll be a wonderful empress, for she always knows what to say or do. Elizabeth admits she sometimes wishes she could be more like her, and they hug. Back in Vienna, and things take a turn for the bazaar, when Franz walks into his office that night and finds the bear pelt from earlier being worn by a naked woman. Turns out she is Franz's lover. And the bear thing is some kind of role-play kink. I don't know, and I don't care to know. Uh, most importantly, though, she remarks that he seems deeply unhappy, and it's been months since she has heard him laugh. Keep a pin on that one, okay? Mm. The following morning, Sophie and Franz arrive at Bad Ischl. Helene, Elizabeth, and their mother prepare for their meeting, only to find that their trunk has not yet arrived with their clothes. All they have is mourning attire for some inexplicable reason. And Elaine starts to have a breakdown and her mother turns to drink. It's only a glass of sherry, but considering it's the AM, it's amusing. Elizabeth's relative calmness irritates the two women and she's sent off for a walk. She sneaks downstairs, barefoot, again, for some reason, uh, as the servants are all preparing for the day, one of the servants opens up the cage of one of many, many tropical birds in the house, and one of the birds flies out and smacks bang into a window pane. Elizabeth, friend to animals that she is, scoops up the little canary and carries it outside. While carrying the bird, she accidentally runs into a handsomely disheveled Franz, who <laughs> just finished his morning horse ride, coincidentally. <laughs> Instead of being normal and greeting him, she ducks behind a tree. He obviously sees her and he's like, why are you hiding? Slash spying on me. Slash why are you wearing any shoes? Slash what's with the bird? Which then makes Elizabeth snap at him for asking too many questions. Ironic. <laughs> given her mother's <laughs> earlier instructions. She then realises she's being rude to the actual emperor and starts making a bunch of funny, remorseful expressions, which in turn makes Franz smile. The very first one. Uh -huh. um, she explains that the bird was trapped inside the house and smiles up at him in return. They introduce each other more formally and make polite small talk, and it turns out Franz has the cutest little smile in the world. Just a <laughs> shy little ginger boy. Sparks yes. are for sure flying. <laughs> As he makes his excuses to leave, the previously comatose looking bird bursts out her hands and flies off into the sky. And we love a heavy handed <laughs> metaphor at In the Books Network. And this one was no exception. I literally oh. gasped. I was like, <gasps> <laughs> uh, Franz's skeezy brother, Archduke Maximilian, arrives for the birthday celebrations and brings his Italian mistress. So brace yourself for some fondling and inappropriate behavior. He introduces Baroness Francesca of something to his mother and his littlest brother, who we also meet for the first time, a tiny little ginger boy called Ludwig Victor. And despite his ridiculous name, he's a cutie. 
Uh, in the drawing room, Elaine, Elizabeth, and their mother wait to be introduced to their hosts, dressed in ridiculously heavy black dresses that appear to be suffocating them in the oppressive heat of summer. They rise when the royal family appears, and much fuss is made over Franz's introduction to Elaine, but his attention is immediately drawn to Elizabeth. Of course! <laughs> of course. Uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, time for tea, everybody. Uh, Elizabeth is put on the kids' table with Ludwig Victor, a uh, Ludwig Victor doll, and Maximilian and his mistress. So obviously, over there in the corner, all of you really unnecessary people. Uh, across the room, the grown-ups are trying to foster small talk between the intended couple, but it really doesn't work because Franz stares longingly at Elizabeth instead. She's looking extra cute by making funny faces at his younger brother to make him giggle. Maximilian begins to flirt with Elizabeth and even takes pot shots at his Italian mistress in German, knowing she cannot understand. Charming. <sighs> he then undercuts this by pawing at the poor countess at the table. Gross. He even has the nerve to ask Ludwig not to play with his doll at the table. Elizabeth tells him she was about to ask him to do the same. Zing. <laughs> that doll was really creepy though. Oh my god, yeah. that face. Yeah. yeah. But yes, well 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 played, Elizabeth. The party then heads outside for a stroll, because nothing says fun 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 like full morning attire in the middle of a heat wave. Yeah. <sighs> Franz is of course partnered off with Helena. Her name well, I can't remember what her name is. Who gives him a gift? An embroidered handkerchief, which I guess is sweet. But further along in their walk, she gets understandably sweaty, and he then offers her back the handkerchief, which, like, <laughs> devastates Helene, because she knows she's being rejected. She's not stupid. Meanwhile, <laughs> Elizabeth is followed by a creepy Max, who tries to ingratiate himself with her by offering her a flower. Uncomfortable, Elizabeth offers it up to his mistress instead. <laughs> and then as soon as she gets it, she starts hitting him like, I know what you're trying! I'm not yes. stupid! <laughs> uh, the party all meets up again to raise a champagne toast to the birthday boy. He and Elizabeth sneak little smiles at each other, but everyone else remains oblivious when they're being really obviously... Like, yeah. Very horny on Maine. Um, <laughs> as they head back to the palace, Helen... Helene... I, th I think it's Helen, Helena. Okay, let's just go with that. Helena asks Elizabeth what the bird chat was about. Elizabeth lies and says she, that Fran saw her with one earlier, but that she never actually spoke to Franz. <laughs> Across the mm. palace, Fran speaks to Max. The vibe is just off. Max seems to have a lot of resentment towards his older brother and takes great pleasure in telling him that the people don't like him. But in a classic oblivious emperor move, Franz asks him to be his special advisor because he needs someone he can trust. <laughs> you have an obviously dis duplicitous brother. Like, read the room. Yes. Franz then finds Elizabeth lying prostrate in one of the palace rooms. Naturally, he assumes there is something wrong, but she assures him that she's just using the floor to cool down. Without hesitation, Franz lies down next to her. Oh, is he cute? Yes. They talk and he notices a loose braid in her hair. And she explains that it's her horse hair. Um, her horse Puck, the one that, that uh, was put down uh, his hair. And she's braided it in so she won't forget him. She says to Franz that she's not a lunatic. Although she's been hearing that a lot lately. <laughs> <laughs> he tells her about when he knocked his brother's tooth out as a kid, that he still has the tooth, which Elizabeth declares to be categorically insane, and they both laugh. <laughs> See? A smile, now a laugh. Take that, polar bear lady. <laughs> <laughs> the mood turns tense when Elizabeth notices and tries to touch his massive neck scar. Uh, and we need that backstory ASAP. Uh, so he gets up, thanks her, and leaves. That evening, Sophie is luxuriating in a bath surrounded by her ladies-in-waiting. They plan on establishing a mole in the new empress's household. 
There's also an intense sapphic energy in the room that I have to point out. Sophie seems particularly partial to one of her ladies, Margareta. We then get a scene where Sophie orchestrates to watch Margareta and an unnamed man have sex, while both ladies seem unaware of their little adventure in voyeurism. The man isn't making the whole thing kind of questionable. Consent, people! Consent is important. Mm -hmm. Uh, We then cut to Helena and Elizabeth in their bed. Helena clutching her miniature of Franz again and bursting with excitement about the following day. Elizabeth is much more subdued as she's clearly started to get a case of the feels. Helena quickly falls asleep, but Elizabeth stays awake to write poetry into the night. Suddenly, there is a knock on their bedchamber door, and Franz's groom asks her to follow him. Ah! <laughs> Sexy times. She arrives in Franz's room, where he pops some champagne so they can toast to his birthday. The mood is incredibly intimate, and he even calls her Elizabeth, her first name terms, people. Mm-hmm. First name terms. And it's what, Might been well be married. a day? It's been a day. <laughs> Not even a day. Uh, not even a day. Used to being called Sissy, she says he she hasn't heard her actual name in a long time. Franz tells her that she makes him feel like he did before he became Emperor alive. Whatever that means. That's very fake. Uh, they share a really sweet smile. Mm-hmm. Franz edges towards her, presumably for a kiss, but Elizabeth starts freaking out and protests that he is to wed her sister. Franz tells her that he wants her instead. He says, those around me have always told me what to do. No more. I mean, yeah. you might as well, Elizabeth could have said those lines anyway. Yeah. <laughs> he strokes her cheek. Sweet. Yeah. Love a cheek stroke. Yes. And then swoops in for a kiss or, you know, five or six. <laughs> Who's counting? <laughs> The fear! Yes! Yes! Um, but then they pull apart, and Elizabeth looks troubled, thinking about her sister she just betrayed, probably. Uh-huh. She leaves the room in a dramatic flounce. I, I love a good you know, it's flounce. It's the middle of the night, and she's just snuck to his room, and she's like, swinging all the doors open. Yes. <laughs> like, girl, uh, you're, you really don't need to make your presence known uh, at this hour of night. Mm-hmm. The next morning, the party assembles in the drawing room. Luckily, this time, the girls are no longer in mourning attire. After everyone sings happy birthday to Franz, he proposes a toast, and he declares his intention of marrying... (laughs) It's Elizabeth. (laughs) A crushed Elena whimpers and runs out of the room. Elizabeth chases after her. Helena slaps her and asks her to reject the proposal. Elizabeth clearly doesn't want to and tells her sister she's never felt this way before. Elena, horrified, accuses her of scurrying into Franz's bed the previous night. She also yells that she won't be a good empress and that will destroy Franz. Elizabeth looks like she kind of believes that. Back in the parlor, the mamas are losing their collective shit. Franz and beg him to change his mind. They think Elizabeth is too willful to make a dutiful empress. Franz responds with the iconic line, Elizabeth or none. The three of them find Elizabeth alone in her room. Ludwika tries to get her daughter to cry off, but she stands her ground. Sophie is like, enough of this shit, and instead approaches her herself and asks the all-important question, do you want to be an empress? There is a long pause before Elizabeth responds confidently, yes. In some other room, not really clear which one, because everyone else was in their bedroom, Ellen. She's in a different one. It doesn't make any sense. Uh huh. <laughs> Lena opens up a drawer and pulls out a pair of scissors and looks at it, contemplating what I have no doubt is a terrible self-inflicted mm-hmm. haircut. Oh, yes. Don't do it, Helena. No. Elizabeth says goodbye to her betrothed by giving him the lock of Puck's hair and tying it into a bracelet for him. Smart. Mark your territory while he is back at court with that polar bear wearing bitch. He is taken. 
Elsewhere, yes. <laughs> Max rage smashes one of the dozens of birthday <laughs> cakes because he has anger management <laughs> issues or hates cake. I'm not sure which one yet. Yeah. <laughs> we then get a shot of Elizabeth looking at the marble floor of the entrance to the palace, which conveniently is shaped like a map of Austria. It has all the names of the surrounding empires, so viewers at home get a little bit of help. We thank you, Netflix, of course, but I have serious doubts that the Habsburgs would have needed help finding Vienna on that map. Anyway, Elizabeth's mother climbs down the stairs and tells her that they have a lot of work to do, and then barks sissy at her because it's obvious she's not listening. She is corrected coolly. My name's Elizabeth. Mic drop. Back in the grubby streets of Vienna, the Poors learn that they are to have a new empress. This is particularly exciting to a man and woman we saw earlier at the execution because it gives them an opportunity to enact their plan for a revolution. And they say that out loud, right next to a police officer, which is so incredibly dumb. It's like they're asking to be uh-huh. hanged. But nevertheless, the episode <laughs> ended. Ta-da! Yes. <laughs> so much to talk about. Um, let's start off yeah. with uh, how familiar are you with Elizabeth of uh, Austria? Not at all. Not at all. Were you like, who is this bitch? <laughs> Why is she famous? Yeah, I, I was I was like, okay. I, you know, I knew about um, the emperor and... You know, I knew that the assassination uh, launched the, oh, the Franz First World War. Ferdinand, my boy. But that's about all I knew. L- what's his name? Ludwig Ludwig Victors. That's his son that uh, gets assassinated. Aha. Uh-huh. So, so I yeah. You no, know, you gotta love a bit of Franz Ferdinand. <laughs> He's iconic. <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> I know a little bit. Uh, I know about the 1950s movies because I have like friends who are who lived in Austria and Italy, um, and I have watched the first Sissy movie ages ago because it was on in Portugal. Um, I think because Portugal had a lot of um, immigrants that moved to that part of Central Europe. Um, when they came back, they were sort of like, mm. "Show this movie at Christmas or something," and it just ended up. And I ended up watching it, but it's in German and all of the subtitles were Portuguese uh. and I'm self-taught Portuguese. Oh um, no. So uh. I I wouldn't say that I really understood <laughs> I'm very slow at reading and so I sort of got <laughs> the point of scenes but not I wouldn't say I could enjoy it the situation. It was giving me a headache. Um Aww. and I actually I, the things I know about Elizabeth tend to be about like the run up to World War One, like you, like it's mostly like mm-hmm. stuff that happened later in her life. I'm not really very familiar with her earlier life or like who she was as a person. Mm-hmm. So I'm like a blank slate, except that mm-hmm. I've seen that movie, but I don't think that movie is very accurate. Uh, <laughs> she's like running around, like she's like feeding a goat some milk or whatever. <laughs> she's like. Going fishing. Oh my goodness. It's like, uh, very weird. Wishful thinking people? I don't know. <laughs> I actually remember some of the visuals to that movie quite well, though. Towards the end, there's like these really incredible uh, shots because they were shooting on like real locations with thousands of extras. So there are mm-hmm. scenes like shot on the streets of Vienna, and there's this one scene where she's. Um, a p- about to be married and they put her on this huge barge in the middle of the Danube and they like just (laughs) there's like thousands of extras on the sides of the river like waving at her and it's just like the big it's like the most epic film I've ever seen I was just like how did they there are that many people in Europe (laughs) how much money did they have (laughs) but I I tried to get a a hold of a copy with English subtitles in the UK, and it's absolutely impossible because I really want to rewatch it and see how it stacks up. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just doesn't exist here. It mm-hmm. does exist in America. I was really annoyed. <laughs> I was going on Amazon oh. US. <laughs> you could watch it if you're interested. Oh. I mean, what's it called? It's called Sissy. Okay. Wikipedia told me that there was in America. 
there's like a supercut of the there's three films and they've sliced them all together to make one film for American audiences for some reason. Because you know we can't deal with uh... subtitles. Yeah. If anyone knows how I can bloody watch this movie without like having to perform some kind of blood sacrifice, that would be great. <laughs> <sighs> email us um i'll take a look for it uh what's your first impression of this show um i thought it was incredibly beautiful they have not spared the quaint on this show it the scenery was amazing the costumes which i know we're going to get into later um stunning uh i i and i really liked the way that this first chapter set us up to get to know the characters. It was a little heavy handed at times with the metaphor, use of metaphors, but, um, I think you've got to be sometimes people do not pay attention. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I thought it was absolutely stunning and I really enjoyed the first episode. Hi. And I think what excited me most about it was that I was like, oh, there's so much to talk about. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we watch things to review and I'm like, yeah, I liked it, but what are we going to talk about? And like with this, there's so many different things going on here because there's like the historical accuracy, dis- accuracy discussion, mm-hmm. then the actual show's narrative, mm-hmm. and then you've got like the meta narrative with the sissy films and i felt like with this episode especially there were like so many like <laughs> sissy disses <laughs> yeah oh yes like, <laughs> so pot shots were thrown at sissy and they were like this isn't sissy okay yeah so, um <laughs> we 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 a different bitch than sissy okay <laughs> <laughs> this is an elizabeth show yes. um so it, it's gonna be interesting to talk about on a podcast as well mm-hmm. yeah um and sometimes I get more excited about that than the actual episode. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's juicy. I like mm-hmm. it. Um, so, storylines. Break them down. Yes. Introduction of Elizabeth. We'll start there. The first episode's like mission statement was obviously to introduce the audience to mm-hmm. the show's version of Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. Which may, not, may or may not be historically accurate. <laughs> um, and they did a really good job with that. In, like I said, like having seen the sissy movie, my <laughs> memory of her was of her being, because it's a much more like lighthearted take. She's like mischievous and a rule breaker, but she's still like sort of sunshine and light. And mm-hmm. this show has shown like a different side. It's much darker. I mean, she is reckless. Yes. Like to the point where she like. Almost killed, almost, almost killed, almost dies. Yeah, um, yeah, and winds up getting her favorite horse killed. And there are times when I think she was being quite selfish and like lying to her sister. And there's just like <laughs> there's more complexity to her. She's not always like in the right. right. She's much more well rounded as a result of that because you know. I admire a problematic faith. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, and and someone someone who is you know believable to she, you know mm. she's she is not a Disney princess, uh, even though they have her engaged in exceedingly Disney princess tropes. I mean, it's sort the, of like the, brave, the bird freeing, and you know all that kind of stuff. But um, you know, she is uh, flawed, and yeah. You know, that is something that, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, unpacking uh, over the course of these uh, these next episodes. And I think one of the more interesting things that they've done in the first episode is like kind of explain why she's maybe a little bit more fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely through her relationship to her family and their dynamics. Yeah. I found the dynamic with her mother really interesting because as much as I think it's really toxic, I have some sympathy for her mother because she's trying to secure a future for her daughters Mm -hmm. within the framework of the current world that she knows. Mm -hmm. And 
she doesn't really understand how a woman can make money and survive off of poetry. Yeah. And Elizabeth's behaviour sort of risks everything for them. The stakes are really high because mm -hmm. her sister's engaged, well, pre-engaged? Yes. <laughs> pre-engaged to a, a fucking emperor. So she can't be seen out riding in her underwear. Like, she's, like it's just... <laughs> It's not done, girl. <laughs> it's just like, do you want to ruin everyone's reputations? Um, and she also has a fucking ulcer <laughs> she's having to deal with. <laughs> like, the stress is so much. And her husband mm -hmm. is just like a drunk adulterer who is clearly not engaging properly. Right. I think she's obviously not doing a great job of mothering, <laughs> but it's understandable. Mm -hmm. Like, I was like... I get you, sis. You're yeah. a terrible mother, but yeah. <laughs> who would be in that circumstances? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, you know, she needs she needs her daughters to to behave a certain way in order for everything to to pan out well for them. And, you know, mm -hmm. she's got enough to deal with already with crazy threesome boy. Um right. yeah, <laughs> for a husband. Um, you know, she does and and you know her stomach a bleeding ulcer yeah she doesn't have time i for mean this i shit. was surprised she managed to stop herself from slapping her because i, I if somebody reacted that indifferently to me bleeding out i would maybe <laughs> slap uh <-huh>. them <laughs> yeah and um, speaking of the adulterer i <laughs> thought her relationship with her father was interesting because She's obviously closer to him because she was able to go to him about the horse situation. Mm -hmm. But he seems like a dick. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. He is not. He is. He is not an admirable man. Thank you. He was quite brutal in the way that he handled the whole horse killing situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I appreciated that he had the your actions have real world consequences conversation. I wish every, like, literally every. Like, rule defying, I'm going to ride out in the middle of <laughs> the night. Like, how many um, period dramas have we seen the the stubborn, rebellious girl ride out on horseback by herself? Um, like, all of them. Bridgerton? Hello? Bridgerton? <laughs> so much Bridgerton. Mm -hmm. There's never any consequences to that kind of behaviour. So it was nice to, like, hey, let's set some real world expectations of this can go very fucking wrong. And you could end up dead. Yeah. Um. So it was nice to have that conversation, but also I was coming from him, and I was like, "Please, just <laughs> go back to your threesome and leave us alone. Yeah. You're a terrible person." Well, you know, and he, you know, he's talking about actions having consequences, dude. You're having a threesome in your own house. You well, know, your wife is downstairs trying to With raise a your family. Ulcer that is, you know, getting ready to go nuclear. Talk about actions having consequences. I Man wonder, up, asshole. Do you think <clears throat> Elizabeth's going to have some daddy issues? Oh, God. She can't I don't have know. a great relationship with men when, no. like, that's the foundation. Mm -hmm. Ironically, I think her, the healthiest relationship was that with her sister. Mm -hmm. I thought the relationship was really sweet, you know. Um, <laughs> I love because before she the, fucked Before it the and... whole betrayal <laughs> she thing. Fucked over um, for a guy she's uh, known for less than 24 I hours know. i know um <laughs> uh, but yeah i mean i thought that that they had a very sweet relationship and you know then shit goes sideways i found elizabeth to be quite ruthless mm -hmm. with the way she was just like she when he announced that he wanted to marry her in front of everyone her first reaction was like not oh i wonder how my sister feels she's like grinning manically like yay, yay! <laughs> I, won. I got yay! picked he gets me um, awesome you know that kind of thing uh-huh no nah. yeah i mean once you know and who knows how closeted and uh, closeted and cloistered uh the the girls had been you know prior to this time um you know it, it's the first time that you know elizabeth is experiencing these feelings and you know obviously it must be so uh dramatic for her that she's willing to to basically say you're my sister i love you but he's mine <laughs> after a day you know i mean she does say she's never felt like this mm -hmm. 
and she's probably been miserable for months and he's been miserable for months and they mm-hmm. meet each other and they're like yay we make each other happy yeah. um so i and un- psychologically i understand why they would glom on to each other mm-hmm. um in such a short amount of time but then like i also am like that is just so reckless and mm-hmm impulsive and it doesn't speak of like great decision making skills <laughs> like, mm-hmm. just, she's just like yes I'll be an empress and she's not really thinking about <laughs> what it would act the actual what it lifestyle means. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah yeah it's like uh you you don't know you have no idea because you weren't raised for this purpose you were raised to marry some other a duke dude you know, a duke. Uh, Elisa like her dad, you know, kind of like lower level nobility mm-hmm. yeah. who will leave her alone to raise the children. Like, Right. But uh, no, she's like, I, I'm going to step into the spotlight. Um, and she, when you use the word ruthless, um, yeah. that really is the perfect word for that moment. You know, once she, um, once she, basically uh shares her feelings with Franz you know based on how she has behaved previously that she's like that's my decision I don't care who it hurts this is what I'm gonna do you know reckless reckless I feel, reckless I feel like that conversation she had with her fat father is like exactly right for this decision she makes later. Yep. She's still acting in the same way. Mm-hmm. She's not learned anything from losing Puck. So when she does the thing about like, so I don't forget, I'm like, you're not remembering the right parts. Seriously. <laughs> you're, remem- you're remembering Puck, but you're not remembering how you got Pucked killed. Uh-huh. And this is <laughs> just like, oh. Uh-huh. God, I-, I feel I really like her, but she's not making good choices. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I'm like, oh, bless you. S- stop it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. She is impulsive and reckless and ruthless when she needs to be. Mm-hmm. The ruthlessness might help her survive the court. I know she is like, I'm just a free bird and I need my... <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> my swallow, my swallow, swallowy I'm gonna f- wings. Fly to away and do what I like. Fly, fly okay. to heaven and blah blah blah. Uh huh. But she does have this ruthless streak where, when she's determined to do something, she gonna do it. Yeah, she's, she's gonna, gonna do, do it. it. And I think that's a similar quality that I see in Franz's mum, mm-hmm. where she has that kind of steeliness. Yeah, and I think if she can grow up a little bit. And channel the ruthlessness energy. She too can be borderline crazy psychopathic <laughs> mother in charge. <laughs> oh gosh! We got introduced to Franz as well. Mm-hmm. It was sort of like an episode that was just like split between their two perspectives. Um, what did you think of Franz Joseph? I liked him. Yeah, uh, I liked him. Um, you know, I think you know. My first thought was. Oh, you are too sensitive for this world. <laughs> <laughs> he is, isn't he? He's a pretty boy. Yeah, you know, it's like he he needs to be off, you know, painting and you know doing that kind of thing. You know, it. I I am not getting clear. You know, I am the emperor vibes from him. You know, you know, uh, yeah. His brother Max gives off more of that energy. Uh, within the first two seconds of his arrival, than we see with uh, Franz Joseph. Um, but uh, I, I, I like the character. I'm very interested to see where things go. Um, yeah, I like him. I, I kind of wish he'd get rid of that like little tiny mustache. You know, yeah. it's period appropriate. So I know. I know. <laughs> I- this, every time he smiles, when he smiles, you can't really see it because it just sort of melts. And, and that's why it's so cute. I'm like, please smile more, <laughs> friends. Um, I see, like, I'm surprised at how much I like him because there's a very, like, poor little rich boy situation. He's yes. In where he's like, but you do feel really sympathetic towards him because mm-hmm. you see, like, yeah, he's the emperor, but he's so powerless in 
pretty much all of the decision making that goes on. He mm-hmm. is like a sea trying to survive all the different waves of uh, revolution and shit coming on with the czar of Russia and all this <laughs> shit. And he's just like, please, can I make a decision for myself? <laughs> can yeah. I not even choose who I marry? Yeah. Um, you do just end up feeling bad for him. Um, I hope we get some flashbacks or references to what happened with his neck. Because mm-hmm. um, that's going to be interesting. Yeah. Um. Actually, I know the answer because of the biography I'm reading. But and you're gonna you, you're gonna keep that secret from me, aren't you? Unless it's on the show, I don't. Feel, I've already had this <sighs> conversation on Twitter with people where they're like, "Don't tell me unless it's relevant." Um, <laughs> and I don't want to spoil things, so yeah. Um. <sighs> but it is an interesting situation, the thing that happened to him. So I think it informs a lot of his perspective on how mm-hmm. to deal with the anger of his people. Mm-hmm. And he's, you know what? He is making a lot of sense. <laughs> he is <laughs> listening to people's anger instead of killing them. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, he he is he is adorable. Um, I am kind of starting to do my typical Google rabbit hole thing that um, I get into when we're doing the show. Shame on me. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> He is really sweet. He's got this sweet little, looks like he's a ginger in some he of his pictures. Yeah. But yeah, he's adorable. I think he has just like the kindest, nicest smile I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. He looks like a little boy who's just like mm-hmm. innocently liking something. You're just like, oh. Yes. Um, I f- find his relationship with his mother also incredibly fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, because she seems to have all of the power in that um in Vienna but mm-hmm. she was never the queen because she um um was married to the brother of the emperor he abdicated then her husband abdicated and then her <laughs> son became <laughs> it's, it, there's, I know a, there's a theme that. there's a theme happening here nobody <laughs> they wants all abdicated and then she, so basically she's never been the empress making her play for power even more fascinating because Mm -hmm. it's like does she want to be empress is this why she's so annoying about her (laughs) son's wife what's going on here Mm -hmm. Um, and what's also interesting to me is that she's got quite a good relationship with friends like they seem to get on i know there's some friction about their different points of views but compared to the relationship elizabeth has with her mother like there's much more respect here mm-hmm. like which is interesting because i'm like what happens when you add a wife into the situation <laughs> is she going to be like how dare you come here and change my little boy's p- points of view like you're getting you're giving him ideas that i didn't give him that mother-in-law bullshit <laughs> yeah oh gosh It'll be very interesting to see where things go with this. They're going to have so many fights, aren't they? Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can't wait. yeah. Uh, Franz's relationship with his brother, Max. Do you understand this? Why no, do- I do not. I do not. He's- Max is so obviously hostile to Franz. And it's like, okay, I sort of understand that because he's probably like, I could be a better emperor than this ginger prick. Mm-hmm. Um, but mm-hmm. <laughs> the fact that Franz is not picking up on it and also being like, hey, I'm going to make you a trusted ally. <laughs> yes, please come help me. Help me be a better emperor. <laughs> it's like, wow, fox in a hen house, man. What do you think Max knows about what it's like to be a peasant in Austria right now? He doesn't know shit. He gets no. drunk with his Italian mistress. No, he gropes he, her under the table. He's he is um giving second son energy. <laughs> you know, with all of the the bells and whistles and 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 horse poop and everything that goes along with that. Why do you think he was attracted to Elizabeth? Um probably because she is like him, you know, rule breaker, 
uh, that kind of thing. But and she's gorgeous. That speaks to so much narcissism, though, that you attract mm-hmm. to someone because they're like you. Exactly. It's perfect. Exactly. It's like God, Max. Could you be more cliche? <laughs> Maybe if he'd left the cake alone. I think I'm most mad about the cake destruction. Yeah. Because, like, it, some poor chef has spent hours making that fucking cake, and he's just like, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. It's like, dude, <laughs> lay off the cake. What did that cake ever do to you? Cake is cake is wonderful. Cake does not deserve that kind of ire. <laughs> Come that now. so beautiful. Oops. Yes. <sighs> please send us cake that's <laughs> yeah. if anybody wants to sponsor us with cake <sighs> we will take it uh, yeah honestly i was trying to think of the last time i had cake and it's been so long it is now making me terribly sad about that cake oh. that you just beat the shit out of i was gonna say do you get cake for thanksgiving but that seems to be more of a pie tradition it's more of a pie thing yeah Oof. it's definitely more of a pie thing that's disappointing. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, how about Franz and Polar Bear Chick? Did not understand this at first. <laughs> I was like, Mm-mm. what is this naked lady doing here? Uh, <laughs> and I didn't know, because uh, f- the way she first enters, you can't see her. It's just like a talking polar bear. And yeah. <laughs> it's like, is dude hallucinating? What the and fuck? This is weird. <laughs> this whole chick just does not give me great vibes she seems uh-uh. very gossipy which is not a great quality to have in a no in somebody you're sleeping with um but i did enjoy the contrast between his relationship with polar bear chick which i'm sure we're gonna find out her name we will continue to call her polar bear chick um, polar bear chick yes um it's obvious that his relationship with this woman is much more superficial like sort of Prid quo pro sort of situation because mm-hmm. they both acknowledge that they're not in love with each other. Yeah. It's not really making him very happy, <laughs> he just, obviously. He doesn't crack his mouth. Just... She's dressed as a polar bear and he's not even like giggling at how dumb it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, he's just there for the nookie. She's hot, so I get it, but mm-hmm. the polar bear thing would have thrown me off. I was like, oh, no, I can't. Because <laughs> what if, like, like mid thrust, she starts making roaring noises like. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. He could be into that kind of thing. I would not. We're not it. going. To, we're not going to kink shame. We're not no gonna, kink shaming. No. no. I think you, pretending you, you to have you, sex you, with animals is is something that I would shame. I'm I'm sorry, but as an animal lover, that's pretty gross to me. Oh well, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I'm fascinated to see where that goes and if mm-hmm. he ever sleeps with her again. Yeah, uh, I'm kind of thinking that uh, things may be cooling off in uh, polar bear land uh, <laughs> for a little bit. Uh, oh. Yeah. What if she's a Russian spy and that's why she was wearing Ooh. the polar bear pelt and that was like a subtle <laughs> message? I, I'm thinking about this hey, way harder than it needs to be. I mean, as many metaphors as they flung at us uh, it, with this that. first episode, okay, I'll take it. Let's see where that goes. What did you think about the actual romance of Franz and Elizabeth? You know me. I'm such a sap. <laughs> me too. <laughs> I'm such a sap. Um... You know, I I knew it was one of those girl don't don't do it don't do it. But you couldn't help it. You couldn't help it because he was being so sweet. He laid down on the floor next to her. Yes, he's like, oh my god, you're so cute. Oh god, this is bad. This is not supposed to be happening. Oh crap, we're in trouble, man. That's very bad. And I think yeah. the forbidden aspect made it hotter. I was like, yeah. you shouldn't do this, but yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, I mean, think about the, um, uh, you know, going back to, you know, our beginnings, the, the pole dark days, um, you know, the, the scene with the blue dress. Yeah. You know? I think that that scene with them in his room was very similar mm-hmm. in vibes, where it's just like... Yes sizzling chemistry they're ha- trying mm-hmm. to hold back there's too much eye contact you're like oh my god how are you not kissing exactly and the tension <laughs> builds <laughs> mm-hmm. and thankfully it's, and it's just 
really close intense close-ups of both their faces just looking at each other and you're like oh my god mm-hmm. i mean you know and um uh, you know it it thankfully um elizabeth had the sense to walk up out of that room <laughs> You know, she was just like, oh, okay, kiss one thing. Okay, that's enough for, I, I can't do this. Bye. Otherwise, we would have had another problem on our hands. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. I do think they they have amazing chemistry. They're very sweet. I feel like they they do have like a good connection as friends as well because mm-hmm. they are able to talk to each other. Yeah. But I also see this as two people looking for an escape from their unhappiness mm-hmm. and going, ding, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're perfect. You're, you tick the box, okay, uh, I'm going to go with you. Not thinking about repercussions, not thinking about repercussions. <laughs> Actions have consequences, don't care, don't care. Yeah, and I mean, like, as much as this is like a shitty thing for Elizabeth to do to her um, sister, it's also like, Franz has just like fucked up his mother's <laughs> Oh yeah. <laughs> mother's plans. He's like pissed her off, which is gonna have lasting implications for his entire marriage, I'm sure. Yup. <laughs> and he's also like it's also a shitty thing to do to pick a bride who has not been prepared for being at court in Vienna. Yeah. Yeah. Because she's gonna have a hell of a culture shock when she comes here and he's not really thinking about how she's going to cope. Mm-hmm. He's just like, well, I like her and everybody else around me can change. And it's like, that's not going to happen. Like, yeah, not gonna, not that, yeah. You may be emperor, but you don't have that kind of power. Yeah. We'll have oh. to see. I am very much looking forward to the next episode. I am like trying to live in denial and be like, this is great. They're going to be happy forever. It's not- like, no, not going to happen. Okay. Revolution. Um, was it me or was this kind of the weakest link storyline of the first Oh, episode? God, yes. Considering <laughs> how... these two people? You know, considering how important uh, the fact that we have a revolution brewing um, is so central to this entire story. Um, yeah, it, it's... Uh, it, uh, a hanging, that's not going to do it. You know, a brief little scene of, yes, things are, the unrest is real. And then we go down to uh, play with the, the royals and the court for the rest of the episode. Until the very last scene, or last-ish scene, we get reminded. It was oh, the last right. scene. I thought the episode yeah. had ended, and then it was like, oh, no, these people again. Yeah, yeah it's like, <laughs> oh, oh, right, I recognize you. Oh, right, revolution. Hmm, Okay. Uh, yeah, we, I'm guessing that we're going to get, uh, much more in the way of, uh, either backstory or, um, exposure to the, uh, unrest that is taking place and, and causing, causing things to begin to spiral out of control. I mean, I'm very interested in this storyline because, uh, as you know, I'm a nerd and then mm-hmm. history. But I am a bit confused because this is seemingly taking place in the 1850s. Mm-hmm. 1853 is when they got engaged. The revolution, like famously, the revolutionary period in um, Europe was in the 1840s. Yeah. Uh, he's got a neck scar from something that happened in one of the revolutionary um, mm-hmm. periods. But then there's also this other revolution that is not his in the history, but I just yeah I I don't know what's going on. We need we need we need help, but you know we need someone to explain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that that we're going to wind up getting um getting up to speed on this uh, more because this show is only six episodes. <laughs> we just got season two though, Michelle. It got uh, out oh yeah. Like- yeah, but I mean, you know how how you know Bridgerton is spun out across what eight? Eight. Yeah, yeah. eight. So still not long enough. No, yeah, well, yeah, of course. Um, but yeah, we have we have a lot to get through in six episodes. So I think we will definitely get more up to speed on the the revolution, things that have happened up to this point, and um, how things are starting to go way downhill. 
Malcolm Louis. Um, yeah. It's a really interesting period of history because it's sort of like the transition from history to like modern Europe. Mm-hmm. basically because mm-hmm. a lot of the events in this region of europe are the exact cause of world war one which had like global impact mm-hmm. and so i am very interested in them trying to cover that even if it's just like in a th- the background like while they're doing shenanigans at court like it would be interesting to see that on screen but on the other hand it's so dense that yeah. I'm sort of like how <laughs> how how are, we, are, how are we gonna how are we gonna wind up um getting into the complexities of of what um led up to this the world war uh world war one yeah uh, but h- how do you feel like the map on the floor <laughs> that? do you think like ooh <laughs> <laughs> They've been walking on the, mar- the marble <laughs> floor. Yes. <laughs> the entrance. Trump, Trump, Trump. I particularly uh, loved the huge blue star that's had um, Vienna right yes. next to it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, thank you. Thank you for giving us uh, some information uh, to to keep in our brains. But uh, damn, again, like, heavy handed. <laughs> I love that they're doing that. They definitely know their audience. Um <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Um so speaking of historical events, I've mm-hmm. got my I prepared five fun facts for ah! you from history. <laughs> Cuz I am awesome. A absolute nerd. Um <laughs> so, you know, brace yourself. Um here are my top 5 reasons the Austrian Empire was bound to collapse and it's absolutely not Franz's fault. Okay? Franz Joseph was adorable. Um, <laughs> Here we go, my defense. Okay, right. so number one, Austria was the largest state in Europe. They mentioned that in the show, barring mm-hmm. Russia. It had 40 million inhabitants and yes. it was multi ethnic. So about eight and a half million of those people were German, 16 million of them were Slavic, 6 million were Italian, 5 million were Hungarians, 2.7 million were Romanians, and there were about a million Jews. And a hundred thousand <laughs> Romani people. Good lord. That is just we are so the many. World. <laughs> we <laughs> are the United Colors of Benetton adverts. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's just too many different ethnicities, very desperate people, mm-hmm. languages, cultures, sometimes often different religious practices. You can't keep that many people unified under one empire for very long so yeah fact number two it was a large fucking state yeah like geographically speaking it encompassed territory from today's czech republic or as well as austria add austria to this Mm -hmm. czech republic the northern part of italy um the whole of hungary parts of croatia slovenia slovakia huge swathes of poland ukraine Romania, Serbia, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. I can't pronounce that name. Um, but just like damn, all of the fuck of the country was just like it would take so many days to ride across mm-hmm. it. Mobilizing an army across that kind of expanse meant you had to rely on local aristocracy to keep the peace. Mm-hmm. Um, if you wanted to keep people in line, and if history has shown us anything. It's that you can't trust these white men to do anything <laughs> in a plain situation. <laughs> Fact number three. Most of the country's inhabitants lived off agriculture well into the mid-19th century. Uh-huh. And farming and cattle rearing were still following century-old practices from the Middle Ages. Hmm. The Industrial Revolution that had swept the majority of Europe at this point largely passed the Austrian Empire by, and that left its citizens living in poverty, relying on the whims of nature for subsistence. Um, this is particularly important to keep in mind because our good friends Prussia, <laughs> aka the area we know as Germany, was yeah. rapidly industrialising. Yeah. I mean, they went from being one of the least developed countries in Europe to outperforming the UK within... 50 years? 
That's insane. And that came with rising living standards and education for their population, which is obviously bound to piss off the Austrians mm-hmm. that are living next door. <laughs> They're like, why the fuck <laughs> are they living in relative... <laughs> um, economic growth and all this shit where's our exactly it's like no go play with the sheep and the cows people no just just keep working the land for your landlord that's Mm -hmm. fine um reason number four the 1840s famously a shitty time if you're growing food (sighs) heard of the irish potato famine Mm -hmm. well that was just one of the many many blights and widespread crop failures across europe Austria was no exception. They faced year after year of potato blights and flooding. So 100,000 people died every year. And by the end of the decade, there were even reports of cannibalism because the population was so desperate. Mm. Cannibalism. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's not good. That's not a great recipe for stability. Mm -mm. The widespread hunger and starvation is commonly thought to be a cause of political changes during the 19th century. And the 1840s had very popular revolts in various countries, including France, Germany, Denmark, Switzerland, Ireland, of Mm -hmm. course, Spain. Like, name a country. (laughs) They were fucking hungry. And lastly... Franz Joseph was an absolute monarch, which means he governed without a constitution or a parliament. And I know the distinction can sometimes be lost on people who grew up in republics. This became very obvious to me after the Queen died and I saw some Americans tweeting some nonsense. (laughs) But for example, (laughs) the UK has had a form of a constitution since the Magna Carta Mm -hmm. in the 1200s. Um. The role of the monarch is clearly defined and limited. Now, at the time that this show is set, there were very few absolute monarchs in Europe left. Mm -hmm. Prussia had a constitution five years before um, the show set in 1848, I think. So, you know, again, your neighbour's got a constitution on their monarch. Where's ours? (laughs) You're sitting there, (laughs) starving to death, thinking about eating your (laughs) neighbour. You're gonna start and thinking an about absolute monarch. Yeah, you're gonna start thinking about you know this whole absolute monarchy sucks. Not not really working out for nope. me because because I've got no food and I've got no money and I've got to worry about my next door neighbor eyeing my left hind quarter as a <laughs> lovely roast. Thank you very much. So exactly. Mm-hmm. So you're gonna be you know revolutioning. The yes. shit out of things. Okay, I think we have absolved Franz of any wrongdoing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Tune in next week where I tell you everything about how Elizabeth <laughs> is going to solve every problem. Oh, God. Um, so, have you noticed any themes at play? Yeah, yeah we've talked about a let's few. Let's talk about swallows. <laughs> let's talk about swallows. <laughs> and also. I guess ulcers. <laughs> I guess you could uh-huh. say ulcers. Um, I did recount the poem because it was such an obviously important metaphor that yeah. they're using. Oh my gosh. It... Did you notice any like visual oh. bird motifs? You know, I would have to watch the the show again to to pick up on um the the any visual uh moti- or visual themes. The you know when she's um making funny faces at her mm-hmm. brother at the table and she's got a ye- yellow fan it's all made out of like bright yes. yellow mm-hmm. bird feathers like a canary um and then some of the wallpapers <laughs> have like birds and there's obviously the bird cages yes. and it's very like it's very it's very aviary mm-hmm. yeah i don't like birds um by <laughs> oh <way>. so okay <laughs> I was like, oh dear. I mean, I don't want them caged up, but I'm also just like, oh, can we stop having close up to them? <laughs> Little bird faces. I just find it a bit creepy. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if that's a theme that will continue throughout the rest of the show, because I feel like it was very heavy handed. <laughs> it would be weird if it just dropped. Yeah, down. I, I would have to think that, that we're going to see more of that. Um, but, uh, 
you know, it'll be interesting to see how they, how they um, decide to, to go with that. I think the whole idea of, you know, a caged bird um, is, you know, going to be something uh, implicit within this story because, you know, these folks are basically stuck in the roles that they're in because they have, they have um, things that they're supposed to do. And so I think that as much as Elizabeth uh, is wanting to be an empress, I think she will soon discover just how confining that is. So I think we'll see more birds. And as you were speaking, I realized like the whole purpose of these like caged birds is that you put them in there so everyone mm-hmm. can look at them, yeah. you know. And that's essentially the role of a monarch at this point in mm-hmm. history. They're just for mm-hmm. show. They're there to look pretty and sit in their little cages and be stared at by the populace. Yeah. You know, that I don't think her or Franz will ever have that much power over what's going on yeah. in the country. Um so it's a good metaphor. It was if a bit heavy handed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, let's wait and see just, you know, how many more slaps upside the head we're going to get uh, with uh, bird um, metaphors. Another thing um, that I actually read in one of the biographies was this idea that Elizabeth and Franz, they were like a huge generational shift Mm -hmm. between them and um, their mothers. Uh Because I think they embodied like more of an 18th century ideal of what it meant to be an individual, and they valued their independence of thought, and they believed in personal liberty, and that was more important to them mm-hmm. than like the collective. When you think about further in the past, like like it's a very medieval idea of. Your responsibility was to your family, to your God, and to your community. And, like, that's how you found value in your place on Earth, was through your service to other people. And you didn't really have an interior life the way that Elizabeth does with her poetry and her and her feelings. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't put quote marks around the feelings. Um so there is this conflict between like um these generations because Elizabeth would be someone who would value her own independence more than her mother who was just taught to like hey you're in this family you have to marry this drunk dude who's <laughs> sleeping with other people because it's going to fulfill the political ambitions of your father and that's your duty mm-hmm. your duty is more important than whatever you're feeling inside yeah. and you have to smother those feelings down <laughs> marry him marry him <laughs> and marry the pig <laughs> deal with it pain is good so, yeah yes <laughs> oh gosh uh what were some of your favorite scenes Fran's lag on the floor with her was my favorite <laughs> that was marvelous you know what about yours um i think you know i'm a sucker for uh, nighttime trysts. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> so that scene I thought was was lovely um, and really well done. Um, I think the scene where um, Franz announces that he wants to marry Elizabeth, I thought that was great. Um, and just how the the tension of that that uh, scene just grew and grew and grew and grew into a different type of tension. Um, so I, I thought that that was really well done. Um, I, I, yeah. How about you? Oh, you already told me there's, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I also, I think I, I also really like the scene where she's like riding her horse through. Yeah. Scenic yeah. Germany, just cause it's such a, it was very romantic. It reminded mm-hmm. me a lot of those epic, um, paintings you had from the early, um, 1800s where it's yeah. just like, Mountains and trees, and mm-hmm. beautiful things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the hills are alive. Sorry. <laughs> I'll stop. With the sound of bad song. Tweet, 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 uh, tweet. Uh, how about least favorite? Oh, the random reveal about those people who are 
starting a revolution. <laughs> yes. Just like, you get a revolution? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, okay, just keep this in mind. We'll get back to it. It's like, eh, really? Um, but, you know, I understand they needed to, you know, make sure that we we were clear on, up, yeah. on the setup. But, uh, yeah, that was that was kind of random. But anyway. Um, I got really confused because for a second I thought that was Max and his Italian. Mm-hmm. Same here. I was like, that's the very similar. And I had to, like, Google to make sure they were different actors and actresses. They look so <laughs> similar. I was like, why would Max be on the streets of Vienna? That makes no uh-huh. sense. Oh, my God. Yeah. They look too similar. Please hire <sighs> some non-white actors as well because, like, <laughs> that would have helped. Um, oh, my gosh. Um, I, lo- I love our hot take is, white people, do they all look the same? <laughs> 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 oh gosh <laughs> okay now something i've been waiting for um <gasps> costumes and locations i mean oh god did you get gothic vibes from some uh, of the costumes yeah uh, i was the crucifixes it was the dark blacks i was like oh it's so dramatic mm-hmm. i'm dying I mean, you know, you want to throw in a modern soundtrack, just, you know, add a little bit of the uh, the cure and, you know, we're good. Um, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought that the, the costumes were absolutely exquisite. I, I, I would even go to say that there were some of them that were better than anything I'd seen in Bridgerton. Um, Ooh. I mean, they, they look like much better quality. I'm just going to say yeah. it out loud. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. The skirts, the bell of the dresses um, mm. in this time were just absurd, but so beautiful. Um, I always say early Victorian to mid-century Victorian, mm-hmm. the most flattering dresses you're going to get. Yeah, I mean, just it's- mind-bogglingly beautiful. And I loved how um, they put little coats on elizabeth so she had like these big flouncy um bows to make it more feminine but she kind of looked like she was going to her nine to five in her little suit jackets um it was really i really loved the traveling costumes as well like so many different interesting patterns Mm -hmm. that you don't really see i mean i'm not sure they're all 100 percent accurate to the period but i think they reflect the characters, and I think that's more important mm-hmm. than um, the accuracy. Uh, just like favorite costume, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> the wedding dress. Uh, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> that's have, the- have y'all been listening to us for a little while? You'll know that we we like us a good wedding dress. Um, and I mean, it was it was stunning. It was like, and like I said earlier looked like Maria walking up to get married in Sound of Music with that huge long train um and that massive aerial shot. Um of, just of the cathedral. Gorgeous. I wonder if everyone's been ripping off this the sissy movies and that's like the Sound of Music ripped off hmm. the Sissy movie and that's why we're all <laughs> <laughs> it's, oh. a, it's the exact same shot. What's really confusing about that movie is that she walks up the aisle she stands there. Mm-hmm. The camera just keeps panning up to the ceiling, and you're like, "Wait, is the movie done?" <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it ends. And there's no end credits, so you're just like, "Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay." Yeah, the the these the costume, uh, hair, and makeup. I mean, I know that we saw half a billion wigs um, during this episode, and you would never know. You n- never know that that wasn't... I mean, there's no way that's her hair, because it's so long. <laughs> it's so long. I loved when she just had it braided, and you can finally see, like, it's so fucking long. Mm-hmm. You know, and... You know, How does she not have a headache? You know, and we, we know <sighs> that, um, you know, she was very protective of her hair. And I'm sure we'll get more into that as we get further into the show. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just... Kudos to the costume and makeup folks um, for this 
episode and I'm going to assume the rest of the show because if these folks don't get some awards coming out, oh, of, they won't. Uh, uh, you know, the, it, it'll be a shame. It'll be a damn shame. It's a foreign show. Well, didn't the Emmys hasn't, get award? Hasn't, Bri- hasn't Bridgerton won some stuff? Yeah, but that's a produced by an American company. It's Shondaland, which is American. Yeah. So they will have a budget for yeah. um, basically go, doing a campaign yeah. where they go, Emmy voters, remember, mm-hmm. vote for us. If you have a show in like um, Germany, I suppose, well, I don't know what the production company with this is, mm-hmm. um, they're not going to have a budget for bribing <laughs> Americans. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they. I mean, be. they they spent their money. You can see it in every single shot that mm. they that they spent their budget uh, to create this universe. Um, I love the locations as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it feels expensive, but even though logically, I'm like, there's like five people in this <laughs> <laughs> on this set, but it feels. I don't know. Like they don't make it look cheap. Like sometimes I'm watching. Bridgerton, and it's like, why is there only one butler? There's no... <laughs> like, remember we watched Sanderton, and there were... Coburn had no servants. Performer of the episode. Oh, gosh. Um, is it cliche to say um, Elizabeth? No. Uh, Devrin? Devrin Lingenau? And please, again, I'm so sorry. Uh, um, <laughs> I promise I'll try and look that up for next... Um, episode, but I thought she was fantastic. I really thought that the actor playing uh, Franz Joseph uh, was good as well, but um, mm. uh, I thought that um, Devrin had, uh, she had a lot to carry um, for this episode. She had a dead horse to carry. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was heavy stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, Devrin gets my vote for this week. I agree, but I want to give an honourable mention to Jordis Treble, I think is how you pronounce her name. She plays Elizabeth's mother, Mm -hmm. and she's one of my favourite German actresses. She was in the show Dark, which is just, if if you ever feel like watching a really cerebral show (laughs) that makes you question a lot of things, watch Dark. Um... (laughs) She's just such a talented actress. And there's like, she says some of these lines and they make me giggle so hilarious. Like when she <laughs> is like, get me the sherry. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Oh. She's giving me major Portia Featherington vibes yes. and I'm here for it. Oh my God, yes. You're so right. <laughs> mm. Oh, this is going to be a great show to watch. Um, right. How many bonnets? And only six episodes. Yeah. Um, how many bonnets? How many? Five. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you are always just like shooting for the top of the of the the ranking. Um, you know, right out of the gate. And, and <laughs> until I get disappointed, and then it's like two. I'm going to give it four and a half, just because um, I'm withholding some of my bonnet ranking for you know an episode that truly blows me away and if there isn't a if there isn't one i will absolutely uh, bump this back up to a five i thought it was i thought it was really well done i just don't want to get into another sanderson situation where you're giving things like four and three quarters yeah i know (laughs) i know i know all right fine damn it i'll give it a five no but i'm just saying (laughs) halves halves are fine numbers no point seven five. Okay, so halves are fine. All right. Okay, four and a half. But you know, I'm gonna. You know, I'm gonna watch the episode as soon as humanly possible. As you should. Yes. Um, I've been. I watched it two weeks ago, so I'm like, fucking hell. <laughs> you are ready, ready for it. I'm ready. Okay. Possibly be horrifically disappointed. <laughs> <or never know. laughs> oh gosh, I have a feeling our text thread is gonna blow up um (laughs) after we wind up watching uh the episode (laughs) okay so in our inbox this week uh first is a message from juliana 
I loved the aesthetic of this show so much, and the interplay between Elizabeth and the brothers is delightfully zingy. Also, the Queen Mother is deliciously complex. Thank you yes. for that. We love a queer queer mother, but also yeah. not a Queen Mother, as I explained earlier. Mm-hmm. She's an Archduchess. Which I don't know what what an Archduchess is. But <laughs> just go with it. Just go with it. Um Hi, Rita and Michelle. So glad you're back with another great series. Clap emoji. Yay! Um, well, this series has big tricks for the big ticks for the following: fabulous locations, mm-hmm. gorgeous costumes. The mm-hmm. fabrics were outstanding yes. for both men and women. Mm-hmm. We need to pay closer attention to waistcoats next week because yeah. I was distracted by the dresses. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> emotional music mm-hmm. and beautiful actors must say soft spot for friends mm. hot emoji face <laughs> <laughs> you and me both yeah. he's so sweet he okay. really is sweet <laughs> the story is set up with potential intrigue elizabeth our leading lady is of course all the wrong kind of girl <laughs> for society and court she's strong-willed passionate has her own thoughts and opinions and will always make them known good grief <laughs> this doesn't bode well <laughs> Um, King Franz is struggling with his position and power in life. Archduchess Sophie, Sophie, mummy of all manipulators, <laughs> and knows best. Oh, maybe we could sing "Mummy Knows Best." Yes, we? <laughs> mummy knows best. Um, see her. Um, she tells Franz, "You need an empress wife to improve the country's morale because the peasants are starting to revolt." <laughs> he goes along with the plan, but lo and behold, he throws a spanner in the works and falls in love with Elizabeth, the sister of his intended, much to his mother, aunt, and court's dismay. You know he's a goner when he <laughs> lies on the court yes. floor with her and stares at the ceiling. <sighs> Mm-hmm. I think the ceiling had like dragonflies on it. We need to like either dragonflies or that. more birds or dragons. Ooh. Something with <laughs> there be dragons. Something was going. Mm-hmm. If it was more birds, <laughs> that would have been the best. Yes, um, it could. Oh, I don't know. And let's not forget the jealous brother, Archduke Maximilian, cute mm-hmm. evil eyes, and cool sunglasses. Oh <laughs> my god, the sunglasses! Yes, we forgot I to know. talk about that. They were amazing. Ugh. Um, he lost after Elizabeth, and anything in a skirt. Mm. More out of spite for his brother than any real love for her, I think. But yeah, ultimately, agree. Maxi has his eyes on his brother's crown. Mm. <laughs> and did we mention the young Prince Ludwig, who plays with dolls and likes dresses? He <laughs> likes dresses. <laughs> oh, spoiler! Well, and of course, we haven't even started with all the political struggles. What more do you need for a setup in a first episode? <laughs> Yay, I say. <laughs> Ciao, Maria from Perth, Western Australia. Oh, thanks, Maria. <sighs> Let's see. So, episode two, you know, and Netflix is really pretty chintzy with their uh, descriptions. Elizabeth r- arrives in Vienna for her wedding. Soon enough, she faces palace intrigue while Franz <laughs> attempts to protect his country. From going to war. <laughs> I mean, thanks. What if he just throws the polar bear pelt back at them? Like, <laughs> oh, that'd be awesome. I mean, that. Uh, w- what are you looking forward to? <laughs> uh, everything. I'm looking forward to the wedding. The wedding. Give me the wedding. <laughs> I mean, spoiler, but episode three is called a wedding. What? So- we're not getting the wedding. Damn yeah. it! I mean, can you imagine all the arguments they're going to have about, like, who's going to be the bridesmaids, and who's what type of flowers they're going to have, and who's invited to the wedding, and, oh my god, your drunk dad can't be there, you know? <laughs> like, it's going to be dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, regular look, regular people weddings are always drama. Oh, God, yes. And then yes. you add an extra level. God, yes. Ugh. Can't wait. I hope no more cake is injured, though, I think. Um, <laughs> I, I will have to strongly protest. Don't damage the food. <laughs> what did it ever do <laughs> to you? And there are people starving <laughs> in your country, so you just don't run around destroying cakes and shit. Come on! On the other hand, <laughs> why were there, like, seven birthday cakes? <laughs> he is one man. 
<laughs> oh, God. Well, I've never met a cake I didn't like. I take that back. Yeah. Not a big fan of a German chocolate cake. It's the coconut. I don't really like like too much chocolate on a cake, to be honest. I, you know when it's like uh, dense? Uh-huh. Yeah. I feel like cake should be fluffy. Yeah. I um, I am very particular about chocolate cake. Um, yes. Um, Same. Mm-hmm. I'm, and welcome to our coverage of Great British Bake Off. <laughs> Okay, before we get down too much of a really tangential <laughs> rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> That's all from us this time. We'll be back next week to discuss another episode of The Empress and the Cake. If you would <laughs> like to be, <laughs> to be read out in our inbox section, please email us at inthebooksnetwork at gmail.com. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at inthebooks. And please remember... Rate and review and share the podcast with friends. Thank you all for listening. We will see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.